Good morning, Astronomy 1010. Welcome to our 11th lecture. What I think is maybe our penultimate week. We have next week and I think, let's see, this is the 12th, the 19th, or I guess we have this week and two more after this left is what I, what I believe is happening. Does that sound right to anyone? Yeah. Wednesday, May 5th, That's about right. final exam. So, okay, that's actually good. We're not doing quite as bad as I thought. <clears throat> um, in today's lecture, we are going to finish up planetary geology and then hopefully transition uh, into atmospheres a little bit so that we can get uh, a decent way through that on Wednesday. On Wednesday, we will do the homework on planetary atmospheres. Um, I want to start today's class by going over the four geological processes. And I'm going to try to, each of these can take a little bit. I'm having some focus issues here. Hold on. Let's get that Logitech thing up here. <clears throat> uh, the autofocus is going bonkers and yonkers. I think, uh, I think the brightness is not helping. That ought to cut down on it just a little bit. Okay, um, what are the four geological processes? Do you guys remember? Um, is it impact cratering, volcanism, plate tectonics, and erosion? That's right. <clears throat> Uh, let's see if this marker is a little bit better. Nope, I can already tell you. So we have uh, impact cratering. Leave a space. Volcanism. plate tectonics and erosion. The goal today, uh, before we start planetary atmospheres, uh, I've already defined and gone over a few issues with impact cratering. I've got one more issue to bring up here. I'd like to give quick two or three bullet point descriptions of each of these processes. And if time allows, talk about where we find different levels of, of these geological processes within the terrestrial zone of the solar system. So for instance, I could ask a question on the exam saying, which planets in the terrestrial zone show active erosion today? And you'd, you'd be able to answer that question. Um, suppose I tried that question with impact cratering. Which planets in the terrestrial zone show evidence of impact cratering on their surface today? Mercury Maybe. and Mars. Mercury and Mars. That would be the correct answer if you were sticking, Ryan, strictly to planets. Um, remember that within the terrestrial zone, we were temporarily considering, considering the moon an honorary planet as well. But, but you answered my question correctly, Ryan. The two planets that show active amounts of impact cratering uh, or current levels of impact cratering are Mercury and Mars. So that, that was nicely done. Uh, okay, let's think about those, those planets that show tons of impact cratering. In particular, I'd like to take us to the moon for a moment. We looked at the moon in last week's lab and uh, let's see if I can actually go to my slideshow here if we can see a slide that shows the two different types of terrain on the moon. Here we go. So <clears throat> remember that when we looked at the moon, there are these large smooth patches called the lunar maria, that's Latin for seas. And then there are these heavily cratered terrain which we see kind of here, this, this brighter material, those are all known as the lunar highlands, okay? And in fact, we're gonna use this term on Mars today and even on Mercury. 
When we see heavily cratered terrain, we call it lunar highlands. Um, these dark splotches for the moon are called Maria. My mouse keeps doing something weird. It keeps sort of moving slowly. I don't know if it's a battery issue or, or what, but it, it kind of, let's see. It's definitely not a computer issue. I think I need to swap the batteries out on this, on my mouse. Uh, do I have, uh, one sec. I do have AAA batteries somewhere, but I, I don't want to get sucked into looking for them because that'll burn some class time. So I guess I might have to trackpad this for a little bit. Um, <clears throat> remember that the uh, Apollo astronauts landed uh, inside the Maria, Mare uh, Tranquilitatis and Serenitatis. And they, so here's, here's one of the uh, astronauts in the lunar rover driving across the surface of one of the Maria. It's probably obvious to you guys why they landed in the lunar Maria. Some of these craters could be a little bit deep and you wouldn't want your, your lander to kind of teeter on the edge of one of those. That might be a bit precarious for blast off. They also took samples of, of the surface Oops, excuse me, I, was, I thought I had a picture in here of them taking lunar samples, but I guess I don't. When they analyzed the rock surface of the Maria and compared it to the highlands, they discovered that the age of the Maria was something like 3.6 billion years old, whereas the rock in the lunar highlands was closer to 4.6 billion years old. Because the lunar highlands have very, because the surface of the moon in general have very little active geology, they basically assumed that the lunar highlands were, were some of the oldest rock surface in the solar system, and they used that to date the age of the solar system to 4.6 billion years old. But there was kind of a weird conundrum going on. The lunar Maria themselves are still quite old at 3.6 billion years old. And if you look at the density of cratering in the lunar highlands, you can see that it's way crazier than the surface of the Maria. And one of the first things that I thought when I learned this is, well, in a billion years, you created this much impact cratering but then these lunar Maria sat around for another 3.6 billion years. Why do their surfaces look so smooth? And here it would really help if we could, we could have a telescope observation. Uh, I do have some photographs, but I just know from looking at the, where is my damned, uh, come on, there we go. So lunar Maria. Sometimes you can find a zoomed in picture here. When you look at these Maria with your eyes and telescope, it's remarkable just how much smoother the Maria are than, than, than the Highlands. Maybe this, this might be an okay photograph. You can see when you look up close at the, at the lunar Maria, that the Maria do have some cratering, but it's so much smaller than the surrounding highlands. And eventually to just, you know, remember today that there is a frequency with which meteoroids strike the surfaces of the planets. I showed you guys a slideshow uh, last week. Sorry, I'm going a little slow here. And I believe this, it was slide 109 here, function F5, 109. Yeah, <clears throat> where we expect meteoroids of one kilometer to 10 kilometer size to strike somewhere between every 100 million years to a billion years. And that suggests that there should, there should almost be more impact craters than we see uh, in the lunar Maria. 
The only way to explain this difference in the amount of cratering in the highlands versus the Maria would be if in the early solar system, the solar system had a greater level of impact cratering than it does today. And that would make sense because if the planets had recently formed from the proto-solar nebula, we might expect that there would be these planetesimals or large sized asteroids that were still zipping around through the solar system waiting to collide with other bodies. In other words, the early solar system must have been a dirty and violent kind of place. This leads us to a concept known as the heavy bombardment period, and it's going to come up in our Mars lab today. So let's just take a, uh, a peek at the, uh, the Wikipedia page because they have a couple of nice pictures. Now I've shown you this picture before. The idea being that when the Earth first formed, it probably did not have much of an atmosphere. It did have volcanoes, but there would have been a large number of massive rocks and small rocks as well that were just pelting the surfaces of these planets uh, with an insane frequency. And the heavy bombardment period is what we think is responsible for the highlands on the moon. If you look at the surface of Mercury, it's covered with impact craters that we attribute to the heavy bombardment period. And even the surface of Mars today in the Southern Hemisphere, as Ryan points out, has a, a large degree of highland cratering. And we believe that those craters, they could not have formed in the subsequent 3 billion years or so that's stuff that would have happened in the first initial 1 billion years. So when we think about impact cratering on the surface of planets, it's so important to remember that there was a, a higher frequency in the past. And I actually want to take a little definition on this. So let's talk a little bit about the heavy bombardment period. I might have to erase a little bit here. So this would be a period in the solar system's history from somewhere like 4.6 to 3.9 billion years ago. So we're thinking something like the first billion years or so of the solar system's history, where large numbers of <clears throat> massive meteoroids. Now, I say massive meteoroids because you guys will remember that the, the, the crater Tycho that we investigated last time was about 80 kilometers long and could fit the state of Rhode Island in it. That suggests that, that the, the meteoroid which made that was an eight to 10 kilometer size meteoroid. And that's a pretty big one by today's standards. But not only were there massive meteoroids, there were also large numbers of small meteoroids as well. It's just that there were, uh, there were a lot of big ones, bigger ones than we find today. Large numbers of massive meteoroids <clears throat> pelted the surfaces of planets and moons leaving heavily cratered islands behind. And this is going to, the heavy bombardment period is going to feature in today's questions about the surface of Mars. Hopefully you guys can read that. My handwriting wasn't so good there. Anyways, that's the last little bit about impact cratering that I, I wanted to get to. Okay. 
Okay, Jenna, let me know when you're done writing. Okay, I'm gonna erase this now. Let's deal with the other geological processes as well. Let's start with volcanism. Uh, I'd like to say that if you took a, a proper geology course, you would cover these detail, uh, these subjects in, in much richer detail, and you'd probably learn a lot more about them than I can teach you. We're kind of just looking at some broad strokes from a planetary science perspective, um, and, and we'll leave the nitty gritty to the geologists. So let's talk a bit about volcanism. Volcanism actually comes in a bunch of different forms, but the basic idea is volcanism can only take place when there are sufficiently thin lithospheres on your planet to form cracks or vents, which can allow some of that warm convective rock to break through to the surface. So in volcanism, we have cracks or vents in a usually thin lithosphere. That allow warm convective rock. In the case of the Earth, that would be somewhere in the asthenosphere, warm convective rock to um, build up pressure and eventually break through to the surface of the planet. And volcanism is gonna take a couple of different forms that I'd like to talk about. First thing I'd like to do is kind of show you guys a um, a kind of just overarching diagram of a volcano. And we'll make a kind of cheaper or cheesier version of this. By the way, this is this these pictures, a couple of them I have in my slideshow as well. This one I do not. One of the things that I'm going to make a big deal about in terms of volcanism is normally we tend to think of volcanic eruptions and the lava that comes out of a volcano paving over uh, cities like Pompeii and so forth. From a planetary science perspective, it's also very important for us to remember that volcanoes produce large quantities of gas. And the significance is that this gas is going to become part of the planet's atmosphere. We believe that terrestrial planets like Venus, Earth, and Mars they didn't start off with atmospheres from the beginning of the formation of the solar system. The early Earth or Venus or Mars would have been so hot after forming that they would have been glowing like molten rock. And with such high surface temperatures, gas particles would just sort of boil away. We believe that after the planets cooled, as years and years of volcanoes erupting at the surface progressed, these eruptions could actually contribute a significant quantity of atmospheric gas. So that's, that's going to be an important planetary science issue when we think about volcanoes. Now, somewhere over here, there's a diagram of a volcano. Um, <clears throat> so we can see that volcanoes often have some kind of a, a magma chamber. They have this central vent. They can often have side vents. And they frequently have some kind of a volcanic crater or opening known as a caldera. OK, so I don't know if I want to do every single one of these um, details, but I think we could just get some of the some of the principal ones here. So let's draw a little cartoon of a volcano. We'll start by drawing the volcanic opening. So the, the volcanic crater, here's a new vocabulary word for us today. It's called a caldera. Um, this might be called, I don't know, the dome. 
of the volcano. Um, there might be sort of a, a magma chamber, some kind of a vent or flute, whatever they call it. Sometimes they even have side vents, okay? Here's a vent. Side vents are important because sometimes volcanoes actually have eruptions that blast off the side of them. We see that sometimes in the, uh, vol the Hawaiian volcanoes. You guys can see, uh, if you ever watch those pictures in the news of those ruptures in the side of people's homes where lava was coming out into the street, pretty dramatic uh, example of side venting. I'll show you a few pictures of that later. I think probably one of your, your new vocabulary words for the day is caldera, all right? A caldera is basically just a volcanic crater. Okay, I'm gonna erase. <clears throat> From a planetary science perspective, actually, I don't want to use abbreviations because you guys will get confused. Uh, for the planetary science view, we sort of have two effects. One is lava. Lava takes the form of warm, basaltic rock. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. And lava's effect on the surfaces of planets is lava will repave planetary surfaces. And as you will see on the surface of Mars today, I showed you briefly before, it will erase many of those large craters, which we see from the heavy bombardment period. In fact, you can even see that there's been a type of volcanism on the moon. If you look at crater Tycho, you'll see this on, on Mars today as well, but sorry, not crater Tycho, crater Plato. You can see that, that it has a smooth surface similar to lunar Maria, which, and, and notice there's no central peak in this whatsoever. The analogy between the basin of crater Plato and the surrounding highlands is exactly the same as the lunar Maria. At some point, this crater was probably full of a pool of warm glowing lava. We actually consider this to be a type of volcanism and that pool of lava just covered up the central peak and whatever impact cratering was there. And it probably stayed warm through radioactive decay for maybe even millions of years before it slowly cooled into the much smoother rock that you see here. Now, the fact that we do see some impact cratering suggests that in the billions of years since this lava pool cooled, impact craters came along and, and sort of dotted the surface but it's nothing like the ground up heavily cratered rock that you see along the uh, lunar highlands. So lava repaves planetary surfaces and it create erases craters. It creates fresh new planetary surface. The second effect, which I also mentioned is out gassing. And that's where um, the release of volcanic gas both creates, and this is important because we'll discover during our atmosphere chapter that gases constantly get released into space. So not only does volcanic gas create atmospheres, but it creates and 
release, uh, sorry, not releases, geez, and replenishes um, atmospheric gas. On all planets and moons that have atmospheres, we usually find some type of volcanism at work. Let's just quickly list those volcanic gases because I'm afraid I'll forget to get around to them. So when a volcano erupts, it releases a few specific types of gases. And this is true on Earth, on Venus, and on Mars. One of the principal atmospheric gases is um, CO2. So in order of importance, CO2, of course, is carbon dioxide. Uh, another important gas is water. By the way, the, the, the number one theory for how Earth got all of its surface water is just from volcanic outgassing. So you don't want to think that Earth re formed ready-made with the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans in place. Those are condensed water molecules from volcanic outgassing. Um, <clears throat> another important atmospheric gas, diatomic nitrogen. Diatomic, of course, means two atoms. Uh, let me think. Uh, we also see sulfur dioxide sometimes. Do you guys notice that I didn't list one particular gas that you might have thought to be important? What gas is not present that you might have thought would be there? Is it helium? Nope. Helium has virtually no percentage in the atmospheres of terrestrial planets. Despite being the second most abundant element in the proto, uh, sorry, the, it's the second most abundant element in the proto solar nebula, but none of the planets are uh, terrestrial planets are massive enough to hold helium to their atmospheres. Of course, helium does make up a big percentage of Jupiter and Saturn, but we're restricting ourselves to terrestrials here. No, I was thinking of another gas that <gasps> might be kind of important to you every day when you wake up, when you go to sleep. Oxygen? Yeah. Oxygen is not one of the primary volcanic gases. And that's going to turn out to be something of a planetary science mystery, Jenna. Where the hell did we get our oxygen from? Oxygen is an explosive and violent gas. It doesn't tend to build up too easily anywhere because it will react with something. The fact that Earth has 21% oxygen in its atmosphere is kind of a, is kind of a fluke. <clears throat> we'll get to that later. Okay, so now you know a little bit about the types of gases that uh, volcanoes can produce. Let's talk a little bit about the basaltic rock. I'll show you a couple of pictures, and then we'll talk about the different sort of varietals of, of volcanism that we find. And I, I might just keep it short and sweet to that. Uh, got a couple of slides for you here. Oops. There we go. Oh, uh, something I should uh, mention, I guess, is, is there are sort of two places where we find volcanoes forming on Earth. And it's worth discussing these, these two types of volcanism. Um, one area where we find volcanoes being created is over what are known as convective hotspots. Remember that underneath the lithosphere, the underlying layers have solid rock, which undergoes convection like a lava lamp. So these kind of warm bubbles of rock rise up and apply pressure to the lithosphere, and then the cooler bubbles sink back down. Usually what happens is the lightest density materials, such as CO2 and water, they kind of turn to steam, and the high temperature steam can kind of melt some of the rock, turning it into a sort of magma chamber. And then you build up pressure from gas pockets plus warm melted rock. 
and, and you sort of form these magma chambers and cracks develop in the lithosphere, oftentimes volcanoes will form over what is known as a convective upwelling. Convection tends to keep pushing warm rock up in sort of the same location on a planet, while the, the downwellings, the sinking bubbles, tend to happen in the same place. So what we often see is we'll often see volcanoes forming in the same spot on a planet. In the case of Earth, as plate tectonics pushes the lithosphere across the, across the uh, asthenosphere, you'll actually form a chain of volcanoes. And that chain of volcanoes would be similar to the ones that you see in the Hawaiian archipelago. This won't be a great slide, but it's a slide. Shoot, I need to share my screen with you guys. Hold on. There's so many buttons to push to execute this right. Eventually, I need to just merge these two slideshows. You can actually date. So the, the uh, an example of volcanoes that have formed over a convection hotspot would be the island of Hawaii and the archipelago chain of islands that are connected to it. The, the, the main island of Hawaii is pretty close to the convective upwelling. And this is one of the reasons the main island uh, of, of Hawaii with the, with the mountain Mauna Kea, I think there's still, an active there's still an active volcano. We just had an eruption there a few years ago. The volcanoes that have been pushed off of the convective hotspot are no longer active and erosion has begun to wear them down. So what you can see here is a color-coded scale of, of elevation or height of the mountains. You can see that the red, the tallest volcano, is the main island of Hawaii. And as we move off to the other islands, which are no longer active, you can see they're decreasing in elevation because erosion is wearing the tops of them down. <clears throat> You can also see that you can date the bedrock through radioactive dating. And the farther off of the convective hotspot you get, the older the volcano. So this volcano was probably once as tall as the main island of Hawaii, but as it pushed off, it got worn down. And the age of the lava, the basaltic rock, gets younger and younger. In fact, today, we believe that the main island of Hawaii is actually partially moved off of the convective hotspot because there is a new Hawaiian island forming under the sea. I don't know if you guys have heard about this, but it's known as Lohi. And it's currently an active underwater volcano that's been building an elevation each year. And in the next 1 million years, we actually expect it to break through the surface of the water and become a new uh, Hawaiian island. So that's one way we find volcanoes forming on planets is under these sort of convective hotspots. Another thing is to recognize that vol volcanism is not randomly distributed around the Earth, but we tend to find volcanoes uh, along what is known as the ring of fire on Earth. So let's escape from here and let's just type in the ring of fire. The ring of fire is a, is a region of active volcanism that takes place all along the Pacific Ocean where where plate tectonics is pushing the seafloor bed down underneath the continents. And this tends to trigger a whole bunch of volcanism along the west coast of the United States, all the way up to Alaska, along the islands of Japan and Indonesia, and even along uh, the coast of Peru and Chile. This is where we find most of the Earth's active volcanism. These types of volcanoes form, uh, let me find my slideshow here. Come on. Oops, sorry. And let's go to slide 53. Uh, along what are known as subduction zones. The idea being that you have this seafloor crust, which is a very dense kind of uh, uh, planetary crust. It's also kind of fresh and younger than the continents. And as plate tectonics push the seafloor into the continental land masses, the continents are made up of lighter density granite rock. And what happens is when you jam this 
this dense seafloor crust against the lower density continental crust, the seafloor crust forms a subduction trench and it jams and gets pushed down underneath the continents into this much warmer region of the Earth's mantle. When that fresh seafloor crust gets jammed down underneath the continents, it heats up and it tends to vaporize the water and the carbon dioxide that's encrusted on the seafloor bed. And this kind of forms these cracks and vents that basically trigger all kinds of volcanism. So the volcanism that we see on Earth today is primarily found along the ring of fire where the subduction zones are actually triggering fresh new volcanism. And that means that it's impossible on Earth to talk about volcanism without plate tectonics. The two kind of feed into each other, and they're also both related to the fact that Earth has a thin lithosphere. It's going to turn out that one of the weird, strange planetary science differences between Earth and Venus is Earth has volcanism and plate tectonics feeding into one another, but on Venus, for some reason, you tend to have volcanoes without the plate tectonics. And that's a bit strange. We'll talk about that in a moment. So let's take some quick notes about where we see volcanoes forming. We'll just kind of sum up everything I just talked about. And then we'll talk about our three different types of volcanoes. So for volcano formation, we have volcanoes forming under convective hotspots. So that's where convection pushes up continuously on a planetary surface. Forming volcanoes. And the second formation method is at what are known as subduction zone trenches. And on the subduction zone trenches, dense seafloor crust is forced underneath, excuse me, low density continental crust triggering active volcanism. These are topics that would be nice to elaborate on, but now at least you have some hard notes about these two things that we talked about. Let me show you a couple more pictures before we take our next set of notes. Hey, Jordan, if you have a moment, I, I need a couple of AAA batteries. There might be some weirdly in that plastic fork drawer, or there might be some up there. If you can't find them, that's okay, but I know I have some around somewhere. Sounds good. If you can't find it in like two minutes, forget about it. <clears throat> I'm just trying to get my, my uh, mouse recharged. Okay, let me show you guys a couple of pictures here. Uh, I want to show you pictures of, of lava, okay? And I want you to compare these, these two pictures here. So here's some uh, lava that's probably flowing off of a Hawaiian volcano. You'll notice that it's, it's basically rock that, while it might have been solid underneath Earth's lithosphere, when it breaks up to the surface of sea level pressure, oh, that's, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, when, it, when it's exposed to the lower pressures 
at, at sea level. So it goes from having rock on top of its head to just air on top of its head. That very quick change in pressure allows the solid rock to temporarily just melt into a liquid. And that liquid is so hot that it actually glows like a black body. And it can flow for miles and miles before solidifying into basically basaltic rock. Here's a piece of frozen solid volcanic rock. We call it basalt. This stuff is porous. I'll show you some different mineral compositions. But I want you to compare this lava flow here to this lava flow. You can see that lava has different viscosities associated with it. This would be a high viscosity lava. It, it can flow only a short distance before solidifying. So high viscosity is like honey. Low viscosity is like soy sauce. The soy sauce like lava can flow for many, many kilometers before it cools and solidifies. And the different lava viscosities can form three different types of volcanic uh, structures. Uh, what determines the viscosity is the different ratios of metals. You'll notice that if you compare two different um, types of basalt from two different locations on Earth, um, they are primarily composed of silicon dioxide. Remember, we call this silicates. It's basically a shorthand for rock. But they have different amounts of metals, dialuminum trioxide and iron oxide and magnesium oxide. And the ratios of these metals, I think, are what affect the viscosity of the lava. It turns out that when the viscosity of lava is really, really low, it will not even be able to form one of the domes that we associate with volcanoes on Earth. And we consider the volcanic plains of the Maria to be one form of volcanism. It's made of the runniest, lowest viscosity lava. It breaks through a crack and basically fills a giant volcanic lake up. And then maybe if there's a gradient uh, in steepness, the lava will kind of flow downhill before solidifying. You can see here what look like kind of frozen mountains of pancake batter. This was probably frozen lava, or this was probably once warm molten rock flowing across the surface that eventually cooled and solidified. Not only do we see these kind of uh, volcanic lakes on the moon, we're going to see them on Mars today, and we even see them on Earth. Some people consider that the entire area of Yellowstone is a sort of giant volcanic crater that lacks a dome. Some people even refer to it as a type of super volcano that might even be able to one day have a planetary wide eruption. Super volcanoes are one of the theories of how the dinosaurs uh, became extinct in a short period of time. Now, the other two types of volcanoes also depend on the viscosity of lava. On Earth, but especially on Mars, we see these really massive volcanoes called shield volcanoes. This here is a picture of the tallest volcano in the entire solar system. It's located on Mars, and it's known as Olympus Mons. Olympus Mons has the shape of a giant shield, and that's how these volcanoes get their names. Uh, on Earth, the, island, the uh, volcanic island of Hawaii is considered a shield volcano, and it actually is quite tall. It goes all the way down to the seafloor bed, and I think is maybe even a little bit taller or about the same height as Mount Everest if you measure it from seafloor bed up to, the, up to the very top of the caldera. On Earth, we also find a whole bunch of stratovolcanoes. Stratovolcanoes are the kind of classic volcano that you think about if you were to draw a picture with a box of crayons. They're kind of steep and they're pointy, but weirdly, they're not as tall as the uh, shield volcanoes. Let's just take notes on this and then we'll move right on. So we can call this uh, three types of volcano. We have volcanic plains. Actually, we'll do this slightly different. Volcanic plains are caused by
low density basalt. And examples of them would be the lunar maria, Yellowstone caldera. Today, you're going to study the surface of Mars, and we call them the planetia. You'll discover today that the Mars's version of the lunar Maria we call the planetia. Two are the shield volcanoes. Uh, these are made of a medium density basalt. This, this basalt will build up a dome, but they will flow for miles and miles. Let's just draw a quick cartoon picture. They tend to almost look like a steep, like a step or something. So kind of a large, so they're kind of, they're kind of tall. Tall, but they have a kind of gradual slope to them. So they're taller than stratovolcanoes, but they're not as kind of steep and pointy. Examples of those are Olympus Mons on Mars, or uh, the main the main island of Hawaii actually has two two uh, different different volcanoes fused together. We could say Mauna Kea, I think. Okay, here's where I'm, my, I'm ter terrified of my bad spelling. I do have a picture. Uh, I don't know how to spell Mauna Kea, uh, M-A-U-N-A, M-A-U-N-A. -A. Yeah. Sorry, I thought you guys could see this, but I guess you can't. And that's in Hawaii. And finally, our third type of volcano, these are called stratovolcanoes. We find a lot of these on Earth. These are the kind of steep, pointy volcanoes that you imagine. They're steep, but they're, they tend to be a bit shorter and smaller than the shield volcanoes, okay? This is from high density lava or high, sorry, viscosity. Guys, I just realized that I, I made a mistake here. I've been using the term density when I probably needed to use the term viscosity. So I, I apologize for that. I'm going to go ahead and make that correction, and I hope you will too. It's the viscosity of the lava that determines what type is formed. So I deeply apologize. That was a huge mistake. High viscosity basalt. Okay. And an example might be something like Mount St. Helens in Oregon. Or in Washington. Okay, so you're gonna see a couple of these differences today when we look at the surfaces of Mars. Thank you. Um, I'm going to erase when you're ready. Kim, Ryan, are you cool? All right. Um, I also want to clarify, this section is always one of my least favorites to teach, not because it's not interesting, but because I myself am much more of an astronomer than I am a 
a geologist. So the further away from astronomy I get and the, the deeper into geology I get, the more jittery I get. So <laughs> please forgive me if this is a less sophisticated portion of our lecture. Okay. Um, oh, there's that cute, cute pooch again, Kim. Uh, let's erase this with everyone's permission. And let's talk a little bit about um, plate tectonics and erosion, and then we will move on. Okay, so let's have a few words about plate tectonics. A fully robust set of plate tectonics, as I mentioned, is unique to planet Earth. However, we see things that we might call tectonic features on all of the terrestrial planets. So we're going to find things that are tectonic in origin even on the surface of the moon and especially on Mercury and Mars, but a fully robust set of plate tectonics is unique to Earth. Plate tectonics are of course related to earthquakes, but here's the key idea. The lithosphere of Earth is fractured into a set of roughly 10, we call them lithospheric plates. And these lithospheric plates float on top of the convective layers of rock in the asthenosphere. So lithospheric plates that float on convective rock in the Earth's asthenosphere. Remember, that's the layer of warm convective rock that sits directly underneath the lithosphere uh, on Earth. It's technically part of the mantle. These lithospheric plates are then driven around um, by a conveyor belt model. So, so basically, the convective bubbles push the plates around on Earth, kind of like a conveyor belt is pushed along in the airport. So the plates. are driven around by a sort of conveyor belt mechanism. You guys will remember from homework that the velocity is one to three centimeters per year. We did this as a homework problem in our last class. Um, because plate, these plates smash into each other, plate tectonics usually results as is the major cause of earthquakes. And those earthquakes are caused when two different lithospheric plates smash into one another. And there's a number of different ways in which the plates can smash into each other. One way is for the, the two plates to basically just have a sort of head on collision. And pressure will build up until one of the plates sort of snaps over the top of the other one. Maybe you guys learned about this in some other course, I don't know. And that rapid snap between them pushing up against one another and pushing over one another creates a, a violent earthquake, which sends ripples of rock across the surface of Earth, 
And those ripples of rock, of course, are capable of knocking over buildings and forming massive cracks in Earth. Here's something interesting. If you look at the locations of where earthquakes have taken place in the last 100 years, you can actually see the boundaries of the lithospheric plates. So in this cartoon picture, every green circle or every green dot represents the location of an earthquake in the last 100 years. And I should mention that earthquakes happen on Earth every single day. Usually they only make the news if they have a high enough um, magnitude on the Richter scale to cause damage. But earthquakes are taking place every single day on Earth. And they perfectly outline the boundaries of where the lithospheric plates are. You live on the North American plate, which consists of the continent of North America plus half of the Atlantic Ocean. I'd like to point out that plate tectonics does not mean continents floating on the ocean, but that the continental landmass is connected to the seafloor bed. The lithospheric plates are floating on the underlying mantle convection. There's a Pacific plate, a South American plate, an African plate. Um, the plates here are pushing into each other in such a way as to create the, the Himalayan mountains, right? Uh, two, two tectonic plates are sort of driving into each other and they're basically pushing rock formations up. So plate tectonics not only cause earthquakes, they also form mountains. We should mention that as well. Uh, in fact, guys, do you, Kim, do you have all this down or are you still taking notes? All right, I'm gonna erase this. So some of the effects of plate tectonics are, of course, earthquakes. Plate tectonics also form continents as lithospheric plates scrape against one another building up intense land mass. They tend to form mountains, cliff walls, and even um, what are known as rift valleys. Rift valleys are where two plates pull away from each other, leaving a kind of thin spot in the um, lithosphere of the planet. Here's another important effect of, tecton of plate tectonics. As we mentioned during our homework last week, the rearrangement of the surface of Earth creates new continents as they smush together and tear apart. Think about the difference between, say, Pangaea uh, a few million years ago, uh, you know, 100 million years ago, versus the continents we have today. They reshape the global topography of a planetary surface. And usually over a time scale for Earth of roughly 100 million years. So 100 million years is the time scale over which you could go from a Pangaea-like continent to the, the continents that we know and love today. OK, so this is taking some time to go through. We've got one more to do, which is erosion. Let me see how I'm doing in time. Oh my god, I'm going to use up this whole lecture on Actually, this is fine because our lab today is all about the four geological processes. I just wish I could have gotten through this a bit faster. Oh, um, something I should have done in the previous problems. May Actually, uh, Jenna, if you can remind me, after I do erosion, I want to make a list of where these different effects are, are, are seen today on the planets. So if, if you can help remind me, because I'm very forgetful sometimes. Yep. 
Uh, so I'm not going to list which planets have active tectonics. I'm going to do it all at the end so I can include volcanism and cratering. Let's just talk a little generally about erosion. When I think about erosion, I think about three or four different forms. Um, I think about erosion in the form of ice. Those are glaciers, which can grow and shrink on a planet and move around, dragging rocks along with them and scraping up the surfaces of planets. I think of water. We have both oceans, but especially rivers that contribute to water erosion. Um, and then there's also wind. Wind is a powerful form of erosion that can sandblast surfaces with um, these sort of dust storms. Uh, there's another version that we see in the outer solar system that I'll mention later. Sometimes you can see, so all of this type of erosion, or at least these two types, usually need some type of atmosphere to sustain them. In the outer solar system, where it's usually too cold, Well, we are going to see some planets, uh, some moons around Saturn that have an atmosphere. But in the outer solar system, you often see these, these icy moons that have absolutely no atmosphere, but do have erosion on their surfaces. Pluto would be one example. And what we believe happens there is something kind of like a, a frost jet. Frost jets are kind of a temporary atmosphere where you have something like nitrogen gas will undergo what's called sublimation. Do you guys know what sublimation is? Have you heard this term before? Sublimation is when you go directly from ice to gas without stopping at the liquid stage. In, in outer space, sublimation happens a lot because you, you can't really have a liquid without pressure. So nitrogen gas sublimation forms these sort of temporary, sorry, wind jets. And the wind jets blow across the surface and then they, they refreeze back, back down so that you don't require an atmosphere. Um, to have ice on the surface of a planet, you don't really need an atmosphere, but I think you do need some changing temperatures to get the ice to move around. So in a way, the planets with atmospheres are the ones where we see glaciers affecting erosion. Let's talk a little bit about uh, each of these. Not too long. Oh, guys, there's an important point that I forgot to make. Uh, it's, it's, it's about plate tectonics. And we believe it's one of the reasons why Earth has a set of plate tectonics, but Venus for somehow does not. Do you guys notice that the boundaries of all of the tectonic plates are, are not randomly scattered around the surface of Earth, but they all have one thing in common. All of the tectonic boundaries are located where? What do all of these plate boundaries have in common? Where the planets were, the um, continents were all connected at one point. 
Well, that's not an incorrect statement, Kim, but I was thinking of something different. It's true that Africa and South America would have been connected along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and that seafloor spreading, the creation of new seafloor crust from sort of underwater tectonic volcanism is pushing them apart. So, Kim, what you said is correct, but I was thinking, Jenna, what were you thinking of? Um, this is a stretch. I was just going to say that they're more vertical than horizontal. Um, that sort of looks true too, but I, it's something yeah. else. Do we do an help? Do you guys notice how you don't really see any tectonic plates cutting across the continents? I mean, here you could say they do, but that's kind of two different continents, right? All of the boundaries, almost all of them, take place in the oceans where there's water. Venus, of course, has no surface water. In fact, it has hardly any water on the whole planet at all, either in the atmosphere or on the surface. We believe that the water is necessary to kind of lubricate rock and help form these cracks. So we believe that one of the reasons why Earth has an active set of plate tectonics, but none of the other planets do, is Earth is the only planet with a significant amount of surface water. The suggestion there is you need liquid water, you need some kind of an ocean to form a robust set of plate tectonics. Um, let's remember from an earlier lecture, let's see if I can call up this, this slide quickly here. that water is a powerful destroyer of rock because water has a so-called dipole moment associated with it. In a water molecule, which I have pictured here in slide 28, the electrons, which are shared by the hydrogen and oxygen atoms, the electrons, which are buzzing around all of the different nuclei, they tend to spend more time hovering around the oxygen atom because the oxygen atom has eight positive charges at its core, as opposed to the two hydrogens, which have only one positive charge. And this tends to build up a slightly negative polarity towards this side of the water molecule. And the two exposed protons give a microscopic positive polarity to the backside. And this difference in polarity, a little plus over here and a little minus over here, is called the dipole moment of the water molecule. This is what gives water all of its magical properties. The polarity of the water molecule is why your body likes to use it for chemical reactions, because you can digest salts and rip salts apart to be used inside of your cells. It's also capable of chipping away solid rock. And this is uh, totally related to the sor sor sorts of erosion that we see on Earth. Um, just for instance, consider the Grand Canyon, a large geological feature on Earth. The Grand Canyon was entirely carved out by the Colorado River, just flowing for tens to hundreds of millions of years across this bedrock and those water molecules just slowly but inevitably chipping away and chipping away at those bits of silicate rock. Of course, once you start dissolving that rock, you can think of the muddy banks of the Mississippi. All of that muddy water you see in the Mississippi River are silts and silicates from dissolved continental land rock. And these silts and silicates wash out into the ocean where they form an important type of rock called carbonate rock. I don't totally wanna to get into that just yet. I'll have to wait to our planetary atmospheres chapter. But erosion and atmospheres combine to sort of trap a lot of carbon dioxide on Earth. So here's an example of water erosion where we chip away at, at, at the bedrock of the continents and wash it out into the ocean. Of course, you know, some of the types of mountain ranges we find on Earth like the Appalachian Mountains or the Rocky Mountains, these weren't so much formed by water, they were formed by glaciers, slow moving changes in, in surface ice that drag boulders across the surface 
and carve out uh, planetary geological features. One such feature that's kind of cool to talk about is a terminal moraine. Uh, if you haven't taken a geology class, you may not have heard about this, but terminal moraines are places, and you can see them scattered around Earth, where, where glaciers have actually dragged boulders across the surfaces of Earth, carving out, uh, carving out geological landforms. So here's a little sort of cartoon illustration of it. As these glaciers flow over the course of hundreds, thousands, and tens of thousands of years, they drag little bits of rock along with them and, and just carve out stretches of mountains along with them. Sometimes those terminal moraines are places where the boulders are deposited. And you can look for these as you hike around Purgatory Chasm or something like that. Um, lastly, I'd like to talk a little bit about wind erosion. Um, one of my first examples seeing wind erosion is when I traveled as a young student out to the University of Arizona, and I took the shuttle bus from Phoenix to Tucson, Arizona, and I saw my very first dirt devil. Uh, if you guys have grown up in Rhode Island like me and haven't spent too much time elsewhere like me, it's possible that you have never seen a dirt devil. So here's a, here's a dirt devil. I'm on the shuttle bus from, from Phoenix to Tucson, and I'm looking out the window, and I see what looks like a little tornado of dust blowing across the desert. And I said to this old cowboy who was sitting in the shuttle next to me, I said, is that a tornado? And he looked at me, and he said, no, that there son's a dirt devil. And I said, well, what the hell's a dirt devil? He said, well, I'll tell you what, I wouldn't want to get caught in one of those if I were you. It'll take the skin off your face or the paint right off your car. And you can watch these things. They look like little mini tornadoes of just whipped up dust blowing across the surface of the desert. We don't really have dirt devils here in Rhode Island. So this was kind of like an eye popping experience for me. Not only does wind create a powerful form of erosion that can chip away surfaces of Earth, but you'll remember that Mars is sometimes blanketed in these global dust storms and that Mars has these kind of planetary wide dirt devils. As an example of one of the things that they can create, um, there are these geological structures that I think are really funny. They're called yardangs. Yardangs are kind of like these wind sculpted dunes and they come in different, different forms and shapes. But, but this would probably be a classic example of a yardang right here. They look like these little shark fins in the desert. And these structures are entirely wind created. They're not created by water or by ice. And over the course of millions of years, wind carrying small particles of sand can chip away at surface rock sometimes creating these epic yardangs which stretch for, for hundreds of miles or at least dozens of miles. So these phenomena that we see here are all carved out by wind. We find such yardangs on Earth and we si find such yardangs on Mars, but very interestingly enough, we do not find them on Venus. One of the reasons that Venus has such low levels of erosion is because it has no rotation and therefore no wind. And it's also too hot for liquid water and it's too hot for ice. So we don't find erosion on Venus, even though it has a thick atmosphere, it's too hot for ice, it's lost all of its water and it has no wind. And those are our main forms of erosion. Okay, before I end class today, cause it's 124, I asked Jenna to remind me now that we've kind of lamely talked about the four geological processes in a little bit of detail. Let's try to take a peek at what types of geology we see on the different types of, of planets. Now, I wanted to do it by geological type, but I think what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to do it by planets, and I'm going to see how much you guys already know. So let's talk about the geological features of the
terrestrial planets. Okay. And we'll go from distance of the sun. We're going to start with Mercury. I can show you a picture of Mercury taken by the uh, Messenger spacecraft, which in the last 10 years was a mission to map the surface of Mercury photographically. Uh, I do have a picture. Here's a global picture of the surface of Mercury taken with the Messenger spacecraft. Okay, first question, does Mercury have an atmosphere? Yes or no? No, yes. that's right. Okay. Uh, no, Jen. so it depends on who you're talking to. Mm -hmm. For the purposes of this course, Jenna, we will say that Mercury does not have an atmosphere. The, the gas pressure, if it exists at all, is like less than a 10 millionth of Earth's. There are people who supposedly study the atmosphere of Mercury but what they're really studying, Jenna, is the solar wind ions will occasionally kick off sodium atoms from the surface of the planet, and they bounce around Mercury a few times, and then they achieve escape velocity and drift into space. Jenna, if you were to take a spacesuit and touch down on the surface of Mercury, from your perspective, it would be a completely airless world with no difference between the, the vacuum of space and the region above the rock, okay? So I don't want to totally lie to you here. There are some people who putatively study the atmosphere of Mercury, but for our purpose in our class, no atmosphere. Okay, so what types of geology do we see on the surface? Impact cratering. Absolutely, Ryan. There's lots of impact cratering. And based on the density of those impact craters, the fact that we see them splattered all over the bloody surface, a lot of this is left over from the heavy bombardment period. So we see lots of impact cratering. Impact, in, impact, in fact, just because I want to tell you about um, some cool impacts on Mercury. Can I tell you about this one that's the, the largest impact crater on Mercury? I think is known as the, is it called the Caloris Basin? Oh, did I get that right? Let me type in the Caloris Basin. The Caloris Basin is the largest surface feature on Mercury. It's the remnant of an absolutely epic impact crater site. Uh, the photographs of it are kind of weird, but there's, there's one that I like more than others. Uh... Let me see if they have it on the Wikipedia page. Okay, so this, this is one image. There was another one that I like, which shows it from an angle. This impact crater is absolutely massive. I forget the, the full diameter of it. Uh, do they have the diameter of it? The diameter of it is 1,300 kilometers, 810 miles. And this impact crater was believed to be so violent that the impact created ripples and waves of rock that traveled around Mercury and then collided on the side of Mercury that's opposite the Caloris Basin. They call it the antipodal side. And the, the ripples and rock, when they collided with each other, actually created this smushed up, bunched up terrain that that planetary scientists call the weird terrain. So they think that the weird terrain, which just happens to be on the opposite side of the Caloris Basin, is crunched up mountains formed by waves of rock colliding with each other. In addition to impact cratering, there's, there's one other large scale geological feature. Uh, do you guys see it? might have mentioned it in a previous lecture. What is the other main geological feature we see on the surface of Mercury? Uh, in the interest of time, I'll get to the answer. Do you guys see these long, they kind of look like stretch marks, and they kind of are stretch marks on the surface of Mercury. They look like little gray lines to you, 
but these are all long cliff walls, which we call scarps or escarpments. These features are somewhat tectonic in nature. And we believe that what happened is, it, you'll remember in a previous uh, slide that I showed you that the core of Mercury has, the, the interior of Mercury has an obnoxiously large metal core. When, when planets cool, the metal has a higher rate of contraction than the rock does. And as Mercury's metal core cooled and shrank, it shrank much faster than the overlying layers of silicate rock. We believe this caused the entire upper mantle and crust of Mercury to sink down on top of the core and to create these tectonic folds these cliff walls that are endemic to Mercury. And these long cliff walls were a result of the cooling and shrinking of Mercury. Remember that time I showed you that scarp that cut through the crater and we tried to figure out which was older, the scarp or the crater. We discovered that since the scarp cuts through the crater, this cooling period must have happened after heavy bombardment because we can see so many of those cliff walls slicing right through the impact cratering. And that means that in addition to impact cratering, the second main geological feature of Mercury is tectonic scarps. And that was caused by the metal core cooling of the planet. You might ask me, does that mean Mercury has a robust set of plate tectonics? Well, not today. Unlike Earth, where tectonics is active, these tectonic features happened in the past. That's one of the reasons why I claim plate tectonics today is unique to Earth. OK. Venus, of course, has a thick CO2 atmosphere. And one of the things that's famous about Venus is its runaway greenhouse effect. The runaway greenhouse effect means temperatures on Venus are typically 400 degrees, 460 degrees Celsius, and that's 460 degrees Celsius everywhere. Uh, hold on. Speaking of runaway greenhouse effect, I'm starting to heat up in here. Sorry, we're very close to the end here, but I just couldn't take it anymore. I'd like to show you some pictures of Venus uh, in case you're not familiar with it. Where are we here? Function F5, slide 123. Not only Venus, not only does Venus have the thickest atmosphere of all the terrestrial planets, this is a picture of it from space. Venus is kind of covered in this yellowy white clouds that make it impossible to see the surface. Um, but we've had very little success landing on the planet. One of the reasons it's so hot has to do with its lack of rotation plus its runaway greenhouse effect. The Russians tried for many years in the 70s and 80s to land a spacecraft on the surface of Venus, and they were only successful two times. One was the Venera 12 mission. The other was the Venera 13 mission. I forget which one this is, but I found a picture of the spacecraft on the internet somewhere. I thought I'd share it with you. The way the mission worked is that the mothership flew above the surface of Venus and it dropped this probe down to the surface. And the probe had to descend through the extremely caustic atmosphere of Venus which includes acid rain clouds that melt away the surface of the spacecraft. The spacecraft only survived for about five to 10 minutes at the surface before it succumbs to the atmospheric conditions. But these are a few of the pictures that we received from the surface of Venus. Today, these are our only three photographs of the surface of Venus. Now, what you're seeing here is the, the, the lander of the spacecraft's kind of the metal bottom. 
you can see slabs of hot basaltic volcanic rock. This is the lens cap to the camera that recently popped off so they could take a picture. And can you guys see this corroding here? The spacecraft is starting to disintegrate and melt because of the caustic conditions in the atmosphere. And the two pictures we got from the surface of Venus look like this, and they look like this. You see basically no mountains, no water, no rivers, no valleys, just a thick, harsh carbon dioxide atmosphere, partially melted volcanic rock. I bet this volcanic rock is somewhat gooey, almost like tar to the touch because temperatures are so high. There's never a gust of wind. There's never a drop of rain. There's just nothing. It's an evil, harsh planet probably one of the harshest planets in the entire solar system. We do know from mapping the surface that there are domes that we believe are giant volcanoes. And that would make sense that Venus has active volcanism because it still has a thick atmosphere today. One of the tallest volcanoes on the surface of Venus is Mat Mons. And you can notice that the shiny reflective surfaces here, these are, by the way, taken with radio telescopes. So this is not an optical picture, it's a radio image, that the surfaces are shiny in some places that probably have a higher metal content, suggesting that these could be recent lava flows. So we think Venus, of, of all geological processes, it probably has active volcanism. Besides that, there are virtually no craters so it's a young surface, but we also see no evidence of tectonics. Well, there is this one canyon, but that's about it. And there is no erosion. So the only, the only geological feature that we believe is active on the surface of Venus today is volcanism. Of course, if you want to talk about Earth, Earth is a very magical planet. It has basically no impact craters or not much, but it does have active volcanism, tectonics, and erosion. The fact that it has three active types of geology and that it also has life suggests to us that planets that have active volcanism, tectonics, and erosion would be the most likely types of planets to find life on. We included the moon in our discussion. The moon has impact craters, but remember that the, the moon is also covered in these large volcanic maria. So maria are a type of volcanic feature that we see on the moon. Whereas on Mercury, we see these tectonic scarps. That's one of the subtle differences between them. Today, we are going to cover Mars in our lab, which is going to start in just a second or two. Mars today has active wind erosion. That's primary, primarily its number one geological feature. And it does show across its surface large numbers of impact craters. But what's cool about Mars is you will see that in the past, Mars had other types of geology, namely in the past, it had active volcanism. It had active water erosion. and maybe even a tiny bit of tectonic features. Sorry, my handwriting gets crappy when it gets to the bottom of the board. So Mars today still has some active geology in the form of erosion, but it shows a lot of impact craters. So it's somewhere between Earth and say Mercury or the moon. But in the past, we can see that there are volcanoes that were on its surface, water erosion and tectonics. And that's gonna be the subject of our lab session today. 
we're basically going to look at the surface of Mars and study it. Um, I'm debating between whether I should print out uh, today's lab. I might actually try to fill it out digitally and you guys can do the same if you want to save some ink in your projectors. Uh, just bear with me guys. Uh, we're gonna take a tea break now, but let me get you queued up for today's lab. Uh, in today's lab, we're gonna do the landscapes of Mars, should be lab number 10 if I got it correctly. Um, to do this, you're gonna need a Mars topographical map, uh, which I will be walking you through here. This is a PDF where we can scan the surface of Mars. And we're gonna be filling out this PDF. We're basically gonna be asking some basic questions and trying to answer them together, but we kind of don't need any rulers or anything today, or we're gonna need rulers for just an instant. I think we might actually be able to fill this out using our PDF editors or something and just turn it in digitally. If you want, you can print it and write out the answers depending on how you'd like to do things. I'm gonna to try to do it digitally. So uh, let's see. Our time is 1.43. I went over a little bit and I apologize for that. Uh, let's say at 1.55 or so, uh, just before two, we'll get this started. Does that sound like a plan? Okay. So we'll take a break and I'll see you guys then. Okay, Astronomy 1010, welcome back to lab number 10. We're gonna take a peek at the relative uh, ages of, well, the, the lab is called the Landscapes of Mars, but we're also going to... Sorry, Akim, or were you talking to the doggy? I was okay. talking to the dogs. I had to be connect. I, I lost power for a second. Oh, geez. Okay. Understood. <laughs> um, um, we're going to be looking at the surface features of Mars and trying to tell a little story about the history of Mars since its formation to uh, its current state. Um, <clears throat> today's lab is going to require the use of one, the topographical map of Mars that I provided for you under lab 10. You might want to save this to your desktop and open it up, or you can just kind of follow along with me. Today, rather than print out the lab, I'm just going to open up the lab using Adobe Acrobat Reader, which of course is a free program. And I'm going to use this text type tool, and I'm just going to sort of type the answers in and you guys might even be able to follow along and do that and then submit it to me as a digital file. That'll save you from printing and then scanning if you wanna to try to do that. Uh, that shouldn't be too hard. I definitely recommend that you download it to your desktop and then open it up in Acrobat Reader. I then clicked a little pen tool up here and then I'm clicking this AB. I'm leaving my answers in red so that they kind of pop out for you guys against the black background. So you'll see so far I've put the name and I've put lab 10. And now uh, this is of course AS 1010. And you can put your section uh, 001, 002, and 101. Now I'm noticing, and I noticed before that since I've typed these answers before, Acrobat somehow remembers the answers that I typed. And that's actually helpful here because it'll save time. I can kind of type up my answers faster and you guys can kind of copy me. The way today's lab works is they're gonna ask us some questions and we'll kind of talk about it a bit and then we'll kind of type in the answers. It's basically just an excuse for us to examine the surface features of Mars and kind of go over them in loving detail, but also to demonstrate that sometimes looking at the surfaces of planets can be a little bit confusing. Trying to tell the Sherlock Holmes story of what happened here billions of years ago is not always as easy as it might seem. Let's get into it, okay? Um, I'd like to start off by saying that this map was created using the Mars MOLA satellite. MOLA, M-O-L-A, stands for Mars Orbital Laser Altimeter. And that basically means that the spacecraft flew around Mars, shining a laser down on the surface and measuring the reflectivity of the laser beam they could then map out the elevation of the planet. Mars, of course, doesn't look color-wise anything like this. The entire surface of Mars is covered in red Martian dirt. 
Um, and we'll talk about the, the evolution of that red surface uh, in our class on atmospheres Wednesday in the following week. So here's a picture of what a, a small feature on the surface looks like from the Curiosity rover, I believe. You can see the, the entire surface here is covered in this. We don't call it soil because technically soil has organic ingredients. This dirt is lifeless. It has no organics in it. So we just call it Martian dirt for lack of a, a better term. But if you look at the global features of Mars, um, Mars surface, global, a true color image, hmm, I guess this is what I want here, shows you that it's not just those small regions, but pretty much the entire surface of the planet is covered in this, this, this red dirt. And that can make seeing some of the details, some of the surface details tough to see. Like here, we can see this looks like some dried up riverbeds. We can see that here. We can also see some tectonic crack-like features. But you'll notice that without the, without the different uh, elevation identifiers, the surface can kind of blend together and it can be difficult for some of these surface features to kind of pop out of the background. The nice thing about our map, the, the orbital laser altimeter, is that it's color coded by elevation. And let's make sure that you guys can read the legend here. Um, which colors show us the highest altitudes? According to the, the, the map. This is a participatory lab. Would it be black? Nope, the, um, the highest color? elevations here are the opposite. They're shown in white, okay? Okay. So you'll notice that um, you'll see the highest elevations over here on the tops of the volcanoes. The dark air areas, the, the black and the purple are the low level areas, which we see in the planitias at the bottom of the Valles Marineris and so forth, okay? And kind of in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, we also have some longitudes here. There are red Western base longitudes and black Eastern longitudes. Today's lab is gonna to refer to the red or Western longitudes. So why don't we get right into it and now let's try to answer some of those questions. Uh, here, let's see if we can zoom out just a, a smincy bit. It says, you've probably noticed that the Northern hemisphere of Mars is very volcanic. And that basically just means kind of smooth. Notice these blue areas kind of remind us of the, the volcanic plains of the moon and that they're not quite as cratered. <clears throat> uh, the Southern hemisphere is heavily cratered. You can see down here, the Southern hemisphere is covered in craters. Uh, using the concept of crater density from our class, which hemisphere do you think shows the oldest landscape, northern or southern? I'd like you guys to take a stab at these answers before I help. So what is the older portion of the Martian landscape? The, the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere? Would it be the southern? Correct. And do you know why, Ryan? Because I'm just going off of why I would believe is you, you were saying how the Northern Hemisphere is more volcanic and there are less craters. Correct. So it makes sense to me, at least, that the area with more cra most craters would be the oldest. And that's right. That's one of the key concepts we learned from our class, Ryan. So you did just correct that the, more, the higher the crater density, the older the planetary surface the more you can trace that back to that heavy bombardment from the first billion years. Nicely done. So we would say the oldest hemisphere would be the Southern hemisphere. So just type Southern. We're gonna keep our answers short and sweet so that we can just kind of enjoy looking at the surface of Mars without too much work. Inspect the Mars globe or map, locate two basins in the Southern hemisphere. The Argyre Planitia is near longitude 40 degrees. The Hellas Planitia is near longitude 290 degrees. 
And these two basins were probably formed by giant impacts of meteoroids. So you can see them right here. Ours are conveniently labeled for us. Here's the Hellas Planitia, and here's the Argire Planitia. They're suggesting to us that, that these are actually the result of humongous impact craters. Let's keep reading for a second. The smooth surfaces at the bottom of the two large craters are lava flows. Use the map to determine if you think that the lava flows in the basin occurred before or after most of the bombardment of the heavy bombardment period in the early solar system. So they're basically saying, would the basins of these craters, which seem to be full of lava flows, would those have occurred before or after the heavy bombardment? Jenna. I would say probably after. Correct. And this time they ask us for a why. And I'm assuming the answer will be similar to the one that Ryan just gave, right? Mm -hmm. There's significantly less craters, so they've been filled in with lava. Yeah. And we're going to use a we're going to use a geological term here. There's less cratering in the basin versus the surrounding highlands. This these answers are an opportunity for us to flex our vocab a bit, okay? So we could say um, after And for the why, we could say, um, <clears throat> okay, so I've said this a couple of different ways. Let's pick one of these. These are all things that I wrote, but I'm just gonna not type it again. Well, apparently I can't. The crater density, okay. Let's just stick with this one. I think this is simple and to the point. The density of craters in the basins is much lower than the surrounding highlands. That was the the, the thing I intended to type. And, it uses the term basin and highlands, which I like. Um, <clears throat> uh, let me know when you guys have that typed in. Is this working for you guys? Okay. Ooh. I want to talk about the story of these impacts. At first, the story looks pretty simple. And the story goes something like what Jenna says. The basins are filled in with lava. This stuff is from the heavy bombardment period. So you've got cratering, and then you fill this in with lava. Except remember that these initial impacts were probably formed by some giant meteoroids that struck the surface. I wonder if we could even try to guesstimate or estimate what the size of the impactor was that could have created this. Do you guys remember the rule of thumb for the relationship between the diameter of a crater versus the size of the impactor that created it? Is it? I don't remember specifically, but is it like 10 times as large? Yeah, somewhere in, I, I read in a, in a graduate book, it's anywhere from a factor of 10 to 100. But Jenna, let's just for argument's sake, go with 10 times as great. Let's say a meteoroid will create a, a crater basin 10 times as great. If we could measure the size of this thing, Jenna, we'd have a chance at figuring out how big the impactor was, or we could guesstimate it. So let's first use a line tool and let's draw a line across the diameter of this thing. Um, I wanna note the latitude of this line because it turns out that we can use the scale at the bottom if we know the latitude. So here I'm gonna slide along and it looks to me that if this is negative 30 degrees and this is negative 50 degrees, let's check 35, 40, 45, 50, this arrow roughly points towards the 40 degree latitude mark. Do you see that? Now, on a normal map, you might have a legend that says something like one inch is equal to one mile. But remember, students, we are looking at the entire surface of a spherical planet. And when you flatten the, the surface of a spherical planet into a map, 
the scale changes depending on what latitude you're at. So in order for us to use this thing properly, we're going to need to use what's called the Mercator projections. So let's see if we can, uh, okay here, what am I doing? I need to temporarily slide down and over, okay? Remember when we had a latitude of negative 40 degrees. So can you see that positive or negative 40 degrees is here? Notice the scale changes depending on whether you're closer to the equator or whether you're closer to the poles. That will determine how many kilometers long this line is. Let's move it to the 40 degree latitude mark. Let's move it to zero. And roughly how many kilometers long would that line be, guys? Roughly like 1,500, um, maybe 16. False. False. Oh. Here you need to learn how to read this, Jenna. Notice that this curve here, this curve is a, th so you're, what's happening, Jenna, is you're looking at this 1,000 and you're looking at that 2,000 and you're assuming that this is 1,500, correct? But Jenna, that only applies to a Mercator projection of plus or minus 57 degrees. Do you see this contour line? That contour line is 2,000 kilometers, and that contour line is 1,000 kilometers, depending upon your latitude. So Jenna, if you followed what I just said, could you correct yourself? Did I lose you or are you with me? Um, no, I followed it. I guess I'm just confused. Where do I, or am I still going off of the top numbers between a thousand and 2000? Yes, the problem is they're not just for these tick marks. This yep. one, this is a thousand kilometers and that's that line is all 1000 kilometers depending upon your latitude. So it would be 2000. And even a little bit past 2000, right? Cause 2000 is actually here. So maybe 2,200 kilometers? Yeah, okay, I got it now. Okay, so based on that, now that you understand, what what would you expect the diameter of this thing to, the meteorite be, if that's 2,200 kilometers? <clears throat> 220? Kilometers, right? Yes. Now, is 220 kilometers the kind of meteoroid that you would see every day? Or how often would you expect uh, a, a sort of 200 kilometer size meteoroid to strike? Oops. Very rarely, once in Earth's history, maybe even less. Um, maybe once in a billion years, right? So what does it mean Let's keep flushing out this concept with me, Jenna, okay? I don't see one, these are, these are not your everyday meteoroid. These are extraordinary meteoroids, correct? And yet, Jenna, I don't see one of them, but I see one, two of them. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. I, I would definitely expect these guys to occur during the heavy bombardment period because today they might occur once in Earth's history. But remember, Jenna, back in the early solar system during heavy bombardment, you'd actually get a lot more large scale meteorite impacts, correct? However, Jenna, don't you think it's kind of weird that both of the basins are really smooth if there's two of them? Yes, but also because of volcanic activity. Okay, sure, but here's what I'm trying to think. Yeah, volcanic activity does play into the answer of this, Jenna. I guess the thing that I'm trying to imagine is if there are gonna be two massive impacts like this, I wouldn't really expect them to happen on the same day or even the same year, right? I'd imagine that if the heavy bombardment period lasts roughly 1 billion years, I'd expect them to be randomly scattered throughout heavy bombardment, right? The problem with seeing both of the surfaces as smooth in the basin is it makes you think that there was all this heavy bombardment and then at the very end of heavy bombardment, splat, splat, you have these two big impacts because then they can kind of, 
Because the problem is, if these filled up with lava during heavy bombardment, you would expect the basins to be covered with more heavy bombardment, right? So that's the kind of weird conundrum about this is, how do I see that these things are so smooth? The answer, Jenna, has to do with paying attention to the rims of the craters. Sometimes the rims can tell you different information. The rims can tell you different things than the basins do. As an example, I'd like you to consider two craters. Jenna, if you had to take a guess, which is the older crater, would you say Dawes is older or would you say Crater Huygens is older? Can you take a guess at which one is older? I, I would say Huygens. That's correct. And why would you say Huygens is older? Because looking at the rim, there are more impact craters and... And not only do we see craters smashing up the rim, but it almost looks like the rim was kind of worn down a bit, right? What else might be wearing down the rim besides impact cratering? Erosion? Yeah, it almost looks like this is an eroded crater. By comparison, the rim of Dawes is kind of sharp and crispy, right? Suggesting that Dawes or maybe uh, Shaberel, I don't know if I'm saying that right, those are kind of more well-defined crater rims. Okay. Shea Pirelli also looks worn down. You kind of can tell the age just by looking at it. Mm -hmm. What do the rims suggest about the Hellas Planitia when you look at the rims? Do they look fresh or do they look old? Uh, they look pretty eroded. Yeah, especially the Aguirre Planitia. Do you see all these little lumpy things? They sort of remind me of what we would see when we would look at aerial photographs of sand dunes in Rhode Island. I wouldn't be surprised if this entire thing was once covered up in water. In fact, one of the places they landed the Curiosity uh, rover was right here in Gale Crater, I believe. So anyways, let's move on to our second question now that you understand the spirit of it. Use the map and inspect the rim of Argire and Hellas Planitia. Look to see if the rims have more craters than the lava flows inside the rim. Look for evidence of ghost craters, which have been filled with lava. Based on the appearance of the limbs, which of the following historical accounts is most likely? A, the giant impacts occurred early when most of the other impacts occurred and excavated the large basins with their surrounding limbs, rims. The lava fills the basins much later after the heavy bombardment period. Or B, the giant impacts just happened to occur very late after the other craters in the heavy bombardment had happened and the lava fills the basins immediately. What do you think is more likely, folks? I would say A. Yeah, the rims suggest that the impacts themselves are old. So we can take this and we can kind of circle A. All right, oops. And then for our evidence, we're gonna focus on the rims, okay? We'll say, uh, <clears throat> The rim, this is one way of putting it, the rims of the planitia show a higher density of cratering and erosion than the basins. I think that's a pretty elegant way to state this. Kind of crazy that the acrobat reader remembers all the things you type. That's not something I would have expected. All right, let's move on and let me know if I'm going too fast for you guys. Look carefully at the crater density along the rim of Hellas and Aguirre. The basin that is older should have more craters on the rim than the younger one. Would you guys say Hellas or Aguirre is the older basin? Let me zoom out so you can kind of compare them both to each other. Huh. Okay, I'm freezing up here, sorry. Bloody hell. Do you think the Hellas or the Aguirre is the older basin? 
I want to uh, say Aguirre because there's so much more erosion. Yeah, I think I'd have to go with you there too, Kim. And you can see some big impacts along the rims. I don't see quite as many big impacts along the Hellas. So Kim, I'm going to agree with you. Um, we'll type uh, Aguirre. And why? We will state that the rim, the rim of the Aguirre shows more deterioration due to impacts and erosion compared to the Hellas Planitia. Let's give a second for you guys to catch up to me there. Um, are you guys typing it in the way I did? Is that working for you? Kim, are you are you doing this on paper? Or are you doing this by typing? I just want to know what you guys are doing, you know? I'm, I'm doing it on paper. That's fine. How about Jenna and Ryan? Hellas. I'm typing it. Yeah, I'm typing also, just because I don't have a printer. I'm at my boyfriend's house, so he doesn't have one. But I think I might like copy it onto the PDF because um, I'm typing it into a Word document. Oh, I see. You're typing it into a Word document. Do you have Acrobat Reader on this computer? Usually it's installed on there. I might. I honestly just didn't even like look too deep into it. Well, it's too but, bad uh, because if you had just done this, mm -hmm. if you had just opened it up, if you would see how I've got it downloaded, if you just open it up with Acrobat Reader, you can type it the same way I do, and then you can save it at the end and you can upload it. And that means you won't forget to do it later, you know? I might, yeah, you know, I might do that and then just copy and paste it into Acrobat Reader. What's, how do you spell it, Acrobat? It's, it's probably already installed on your computer. Adobe Acrobat Reader is usually comes preloaded on computers so that you can read PDFs. Just try to open it and see oh, yeah. what program opens it. Acrobat Reader download. Yeah, it brings me to um, like a Google download page. I don't think it's already downloaded yet, oh. but it's okay. Oh, what the hell is going on here? I thought I typed all this in. Okay, can we move on? All right. Most of the volcanoes on Mars look like mountains with a crater on their tops. Is that any way to talk to some planetary science students? What do we call the crater on the top of a volcano? You're supposed to know some good vocab. Caldera. Very good, Kim. Most of the volcanoes on Mars look like mountains with a caldera on their tops. These are not impact craters, but are instead volcanic calderas. Use the map to estimate how many volcanoes you can identify on Mars. Okay, we're going to try to just count the number of volcanoes. And I think the purpose of this exercise is the closer you look, the more you find. And we'll kind of do this together, all right? So let's agree that these are clearly some big ass volcanoes like Olympus Mons. So anything that's Mons, we're gonna call a volcano. But there are some smaller volcanoes here. Some are known as Tholuses and other are known as Pateras. So let's look for all the Mons, the Pateras and the Tholi we can find. So we got these four big boys, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Let's see if there's any more here that I might have missed. So I counted about 12 over there. Thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. 14, 15, 16, 17. 
I wonder if there's any down here. Uh, so far, I've found 17, but you know what? There's even some on the poles. 18, 19, 20. There's probably even more than this. I think one of the points of this exercise is the closer and the more carefully you look, the more volcanoes you start to find. We're going to go with about 20. So let's say tilde. Oh, I can't do a tilde for some reason. Huh. Why don't they let me do tildes? Well, whatever. About 20. They want us to list the names of as many volcanoes as possible. That seems like a pointless exercise to me. My idea is that we will list the, the big ones, OK? And the very largest volcanoes are found in the Tharsis Montes Plains. They are Olympus Mons, Escreus Mons, Pavonis Mons, and Arcea Mons. So let's type in the names of those four volcanoes. Olympus Mons, Arcea Mons, Pavonis Mons, and Astraeus Mons. That'll help us recognize the names of these later on. <clears throat> OK. This one should be pretty damn easy. Using the elevation color codes on the map, name the volcanic feature that has the highest elevation or the tallest. You guys already know what one. Olympus. That's right. It's the tallest in the entire solar system. Hey, can I ask something funny? Do you guys think it's weird that Mars has taller volcanoes than the Earth? Which planet is bigger, Mars or the Earth? Earth. Why would a smaller planet have taller volcanoes? Ryan's got an idea. That's, oh, Michael K. Hearing from the troll factory here. Michael K, that's right. With less gravitational pressure compressing that volcano, the rock formations, the lava can build up higher before gravitational compression brings it down. So it's an ironic thing that, that the smaller planet Mars has taller volcanoes and larger canyons than Earth. Everything gets kind of supersized. OK, the next question used to befuddle me. It took me about five run-throughs of this lab before I finally understood what was going on. If you were to count craters on or near the volcanoes, would you be able to infer the age of the volcanoes relative to the surrounding plains. Now, at first glance, when you look at this map, the areas surrounding the volcanoes look quite smooth in comparison to the heavily cratered highlands. And that's to be expected because you're basically seeing regions where volcanic eruptions have repaved the surface of Mars. But this map has a limiting resolution, unfortunately. If I go up about here, my map starts to get grainy and pixelated. To get a bit of assistance, I'd like to show you guys a high resolution and true color image of Olympus Mons. Here's an aerial true color photograph of Olympus Mons. What do we see up here? Uh, a few craters. Craters or calderas. Let's play a game. I circle a thing and you tell me if it's a crater or a caldera. Let's start with this main opening here. Oh, hold on. Can I open my door one sec, guys? I 
Sorry, folks, my girlfriend got locked out of the house. All right. Um, <laughs> uh, crater or caldera? Caldera. Good. How about here? Crater or caldera? That's a crater. That's a caldera. It is. Mm hmm. Crater or caldera? Caldera. That's right. Crater or caldera? Crater. Crater. Here? Crater. Can you see how the craters kind of have a sharper, crispier edge? The calderas are kind of sloped like this. Um, you might be wondering, Kim, how can I have double calderas? They're different types or epochs of eruption. You could have a massive eruption here, maybe 500 million years ago. And then 400 million years ago, you might have had a second eruption or a third eruption at different time periods. These craters are quite interesting. I believe they're known as the Shergati uh, meteor, meteorite craters. And they're found at the very top of the volcano Olympus Mons. Now, notice the surrounding basaltic rock is really, really smooth and has hardly any craters in it at all. Since volcanoes erupt and repave craters, I would kind of expect the last place on the bloody planet to find an impact crater would be at the top of a volcano, right? Um, these are very important sites. Uh, it tells us on the Wikipedia page for Olympus Mons that these craters have a diameter of, I believe, 10 kilometers and 15 kilometers. Now, the idea is, you guys may not realize this, but roughly 20% of all meteorites found on Earth actually seem to have an identical composition to the surface of Mars. Let that sink in for a second. Uh, roughly one out of every five meteorites found on Earth is a chunk of Mars's surface. How the crap did that happen? Well, if you had some impacts at the top of a very tall volcano, it might be easier for some of the fragments blasted off Mars to achieve escape velocity. At that point, they would wind their way around the sun in some kind of a kooky orbit until eventually, after maybe hundreds of millions of years, they might plop down on the surface of Earth. And we suspect that these are the two most likely origins of those Martian meteorites found on Earth. This one is 10 kilometers in diameter, I believe. And this one is 15 kilometers. If the diameters are 10 to 15 kilometers, what would you expect, Jenna, to be the diameter of the meteoroid? About one kilometer, one and a half kilometers. And how often would we expect those types of sized objects to strike Earth? Every millennial. Oh, every million years. Somewhere between million to maybe 10 million. This is kind of a logarithmic scale, so it changes pretty quickly. So in other words, what does that tell us about the volcano itself and its last eruption, Jenna? Or anyone who's following me. My gut is to say that it's pretty old. Well, or it's pretty, pretty old mean to you? Let's. So it, it's a younger volcano. Well, the, the volcano is clearly younger than the surrounding highlands. Younger is a comparative term, Jenna. Is it younger than your pet dog? Probably not. Is it younger than the age of the solar system? Definitely. Is it younger than the highlands? Yes. But I'm trying to say a different kind of thing, Jenna. Well, what do we what think about? <laughs> what is the question? I'm being kind of vague about it. The question is, how long has it been since Olympus Mons erupted? About like a million years or wherever we pointed out on the. Yeah, maybe, maybe several million years. Mm -hmm. Um, if you look at the Wikipedia page for Olympus Mons, which has usually the most up-to-date re date research, is pretty good. Uh, let's see if we can uh, mention the, the craters there. Uh, 
Here's something interesting. Crater counts from high resolution images indicate that lava flows on the northwestern flank of Olympus range in age from maybe anywhere from 100 million years old to only two mega anim, me, mega million years old is million years old. So they're basically coming up with the same number that we did. We're just students, right, in an astronomy 101 class. And we kind of got the same answer that this, the pro scientists got, anywhere from 2 million years up to 100 million years. That's pretty cool, right? And uh, they do mention the craters somewhere. I was hoping they'd Well, anyways, we don't have to get too caught up in them. I was just going to show you their names, but somewhere here they talk about those craters too. You can read this on your own if you're curious. So what, what does that mean? Let's see if we can get back to the question, which was the whole point of this. Now that I've taken you on a spirit journey, if you were to count craters on or near these volcanoes, would you be able to infer the age of the volcanoes relative to the surrounding plains? What do you say, Jenna? Yes, definitely. And I would say the idea is that even if you have only one or two impact craters, that's enough to determine a rough age for the surface of the volcano or for the volcano itself. And their point is you can always find a crater or two somewhere to help you estimate the age of a planetary surface. Today, we believe Olympus Mons is dormant and will probably not erupt again. Although the Mars InSight lander is trying to study the depth of Mars's uh, lithosphere to, to really figure out, we believe Mars is pretty much frozen solid at this point. <clears throat> Inspect the area south of Valles Marineris between longitudes 45 degrees and 100. Notice that this area is not uniformly cratered or wrinkled. A boundary seems to occur at what longitude? Let's talk about the Valles Marineris for a second. The Valles Marineris is named after the Mariner spacecraft, which first um, explored and photographed this, this feature. Uh, if you think about it, the Valles Marineris, which stretches 4,000 kilometers across Mars is one of the largest surface features on the planet. Look at this, this uh, HST image of it. You can actually see it with a small backyard telescope. You can just about resolve this feature. It's, I think, 14 times longer than our Grand Canyon. It's seven times deeper than our own Grand Canyon. It's epic, okay? And there are different high resolution images. This is one here. When you look at a true color image of the Valles Marineris, ooh, this is a nice high res picture. We should keep that handy. It's kind of difficult to make out some of the geological activity. Like I said before, Mars is all one color. So it tends to have all of this, all of the cool geology kind of just kind of blends together here. Look how nice and high resolution this picture is. It's probably taking forever to load on your page here. Let's inspect the area between 45 degrees and 100 degrees longitude. So let's look up here. This is 90 degrees. Um, let's get out our tool here. 95, this is 100 degrees longitude right there. 60 degrees is here, so 55, 50. Ooh, can I get this all in one shot? Let's try. Oopsies. Sorry, OK, let me erase that. And let me grab this. Oops, sorry. I'm, I'm just having trouble <laughs> doing everything at once. 
Okay. Ninety five. This is one hundred degrees longitude. Fifty five fifty, and that's forty five degrees longitude. You guys following how I'm doing this here? Counting longitude tick marks. Now let me scroll down to the Valles Marineris and let's see what, so they're asking us to analyze the region between these two lines that's south of the canyon. They mentioned that a boundary seems to occur at what longitude? Can you see a vertical boundary between those two lines that demarcate two different planes of two different ages? Is it obvious to you what they're asking? The line um, Nectaris Fosse? Yeah. This seems to be a boundary between two kinds of, two different planes of two different ages. Ages. I think the red stuff is on the west and the yellow stuff is on the east. And it looks like that occurs, Jenna. What would you say is the approximate longitude there? About 60 longitude. Well, it's a little short of 60. Let's get more specific. Okay, maybe 63. False. 60. You'll notice that the longitudes increase to the left, not to the right, Jenna. Oh. Um, and that's 90, right? Yeah, so 57 or, right. or 50, yeah, 58. 57 works for me. Fifty-seven degrees west. Is the younger surface to the east or west of the boundary? Is the younger surface to the oh, I'm sorry. west? Yeah, you can see this slightly less crater density in the red area than in the uh, yellow area. Let's drag ourselves over to the smooth plain called the Tharsis Montes Plain. That's where the volcanoes are. Does the crater density suggest that the Tharsis Montes is older, younger, or the same age as the region south of the Valles Marineris? In other words, they're saying, compare the stuff that we just looked at, this red area, to this red area near the volcanoes. Is the area near the volcanoes older, younger, or the same age as the area south of the canyon. Younger? This is younger, right, Ryan? Yeah, the area around the volcano this would be younger. And and you base that just on what observation? I base you... that on the fact that actually I'm just going off of general like what I would assume be is the area closer to the volcanoes would be a lot newer because of that that is a totally reasonable assumption, Ryan, and I agree with you. I would have, however, pointed towards the evidence of impact cratering, right? It looks okay. to me, Ryan, like I can see a bit more cratering here than I can there. All right. Yeah. yeah. Along the north rim of Valles Marineris is a place called the Candor Chasma Rim. Um, <clears throat> does this area suggest that the canyon is older or younger than the plains to the north and the south? Would you guys say the Valles Marineris is a young geological feature? Or would you say that the Valles Marineris is an old geological feature? compared to some of the other types of terrain. Whoa. Let me show you a slightly different picture. Oh, that one's quite beautiful. There's, there's one other here that I really love, this one. This one I think is just so, so perfect. Look at this picture with me. And I ask you, 
is the canyon, is the Valles Marineris a young or an old geological feature? We're going to go into high res mode here. Hold on a second. Sorry. Oh, shoot. Uh, I just made my internet barf. Sorry. All right, it doesn't really. This picture is so damn high res that I'm I'm upsetting the uh, my whole internet operation here. So sorry about this. Okay, what do you think? Young or old? Uh, younger. Right. Even though there's not a lot of impact cratering, it does look like the walls are um, have been worn down by wind erosion though or by impact craters i mean think about oh. it ryan if this was somehow an old surface you would have to argue to me successfully that all of these craters splat 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 happened up here and all of these craters splat 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 happened down there but somehow all of the craters just missed the canyon perfectly even though they were randomly firing you see what i'm saying yeah Look at the walls. As you point out, they might show some evidence of erosional stuff, but I don't see a single crater either in the canyon or along the tops. Ryan, that suggests to me that this is a wicked, wicked, wicked young okay. feature. Basically, you, you had it correct. I just wanted to amplify what you were saying, okay? All right. So... Uh, The canyon is clearly younger. Look at the rims of Vallis Marineris. Is there anything along the north or south rim that shows evidence of flowing water? Well, if you look up here, I mean, look at these canyons here. Do you guys see this stuff? What do these look like to you? Rivers? Yeah, they look totally like rivers. In fact, it looks like rivers that spill into some giant ocean. I bet in the history of Mars going back a few billion years or so, Mars probably looked just like Earth did with giant rivers flowing into a huge ocean. If you look at the high res photographs that I was just showing you, it's sort of taking too long to load the photograph, which is irritating to me. But if you look up inside these canyons, and I, oh, I don't know if I have time for this to load, you basically can see all these sand dune-like features. I believe the highest res version of, of the Valles Marineris is like 9,000 pixels. So because I've got a lot of internet stuff going on between Zooming with you guys, this is taking a little too long. Uh, let me look at more details and see what I can do here. Let's control minus. Okay. Oh, wow. That high resolution one is 24,000 pixels. No wonder it was taking forever. Let's go to the second largest version. Oh, shoot. Can you guys see up along here? You can kind of see these like sand dune like features. I actually should download that high resolution one and keep that on my desktop. I'm going to let that download in the background. So basically, the idea is that, yes, is there anything that shows evidence of flowing water? Let's just say, duh, OK? <laughs> um, we could talk about alluvial fans. Um, alluvial fans are these structures that you see both on Earth and Mars that are clearly formed by, by water erosion. Uh, the alluvial fans were what I was trying to show you images of, but it was taking too long to get a high resolution picture. This is kind of a picture of an alluvial fan on Earth. You can basically see where, where water from either a river, a glacier melt has basically spilled out to kind of make this fan-like structure. Um, and you can actually see these along the edge of the Valles Marineris, as, as well as on Earth. Telltale signs of water erosion. So if you want to jazz up your image and make it funny, 
you could say, duh, water flowed all throughout this canyon, forming alluvial fans. And we'll add something, and rivers that 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 once flowed into an ocean on Mars. All right. <clears throat> This is kind of a tricky question, number 15. What, do you guys have this down? Can I proceed? All right. Number 15 is a bit of a tricky question. Look at the crater density inside Vallis Marineris and choose one of the following historical accounts of the canyon's formation. The canyon formed before the surrounding plains and the lava flows which made the plains did not reach the canyon. The canyon was cut into the rock by a river of lava the canyon forms a boundary between two plains of different ages, or the plains formed first at one time covering the area, Vallis Marineris forms later from an unknown cause. None of those answers are great, but which is the least horrible? Would it be D? That's right, Ryan. And, and the reason why it's D, they could have asked this question a little bit better, is that this canyon, although it did get carved out a bit by erosion, like our own Grand Canyon, this canyon cannot entirely be erosional in nature. And one of the big tells that this canyon was formed by some other type of geology, um, is present if you can actually, okay, it's, this just isn't gonna work. If you guys look at this picture here, and I, I really wish I had the medium high resolution version. I'm gonna try saving this to my terabyte astronomy 10, 10. Let's see if this works better. Come on. My computer's real, real angry with me. Labs, save. Oh. Oh, wow. Okay, guys. Let's, oh, yeah. Here we go. Uh, I don't know how to scroll around this image. Oh, here we go. Okay. Do you guys see, oops. Can you guys see these long cliff walls here? Can I zoom in anymore? Do you guys see uh, above the cliff walls how you can see these long straight cracks? These don't quite look like uh, rivers to me. What do these remind you guys of? What type of, look at that there. What type of geology is this? Can you tell me? Um, it reminds you of, I forget, I'm forgetting. Oh, the tectonic, the plate tectonics. Yeah, because yeah, they kind of look like hard, jagged cracks. Mm -hmm. The idea behind these jagged cracks, um, Jenna, is it suggests that maybe this entire feature was once tectonic in origin. In other words, Mars's lithosphere was thin and, and some tectonic feature like a convective upwelling pushed so hard up on the crust of Mars that it basically formed a crack, like the, the entire crust kind of collapsed. And then what started off as tectonic eventually cooled down and filled with water and then erosion took place. So although this is an erosional feature, it's also somewhat of a tectonic feature which makes it a little bit interesting. So that's why Ryan's answer is probably the best because it's got a sort of complex history. 
Okay, <clears throat> let's do number 16. How am I doing on time? This, it's 302, so we're gonna make number 16 our last question, okay? Let's look at the area around the volcano Arcea Mons. Arcea Mons is, is this volcano right here in the Tharsis Montes Plains. We can kind of see there's a little channel there and there's something that looks like a, like a, like a brown eruption coming out of it. Oops. Oops. Look at the area around the volcano Arcea Mons. Using a magnified image, locate the ridges or channels on the side of Arcea Mons. Make sure the channels were formed by the volcano. Follow these structures to see if they extend into the surrounding plains. Look carefully that for any evidence that Arcea Mons has been partially covered by another geological development. Choose one of the two historical accounts. The volcano forms first and was later buried by a lava flow from another volcano. B, the volcano forms the plains from its own lava flow. Thus the plains and the volcano have the same age. If you had to pick one of those, which would you pick? Is it, was it B? Yeah, I think a photograph will help us there and then we'll, we'll answer the why in just a second. Um, to do this right, I'd like to take a moment to show you guys a picture of Arcea Mons. There's a beautiful high resolution image here. Look at this super cool high resolution image. Look at that caldera, look how smooth it is. And then look at the surrounding features. Can you see all of these, these sort of crunchy areas? I believe in geology, they call them horsts and grobbins. Horst grobbin structures are where you have collapsed up and down regions of terrain. They're somewhat tectonic in nature, suggesting that the violence of this volcano pushing up on itself has been collapsing and crushing different regions of crust. But now I want you guys to look over here at this channel that they were mentioning. And let's really just kind of zoom in on the channel. What is that stuff right there? Can you guys tell me what all of this is? What type of geology is that? Lava flow? You know, at first, Kim, when I first saw this, I thought it was lava flow, but then I started, well, in a way, you're not wrong, Kim, but doesn't lava usually pave over things? Usually lava doesn't cut holes or cut rivers like, like erosion. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying, what, what happened here? Is, it, is that impact craters also? Not impact craters. Those are calderas. Uh, In other words, these are probably side vents. Remember how we drew a diagram earlier and we showed side venting? What they think happens here, they have a name for these structures. Can you see how they make these long little tubes? They're called collapsed lava tubes. And the idea is that you build up some big magma chamber, you erupt basaltic lava up onto the top of the magma chamber, and then it becomes kind of like a hollow eggshell of rock. And the lava's gravity collapses the eggshell and they create these collapsed lava tubes. You can see the tube-like nature up here. These were probably volcanic eruptions that collapsed down on these underground lava tubes. And you see these all over the place on Earth and on the moon. If you type in collapsed lava tubes, we can often see examples of them on the moon as well. Here you can see those collapse, or that might actually be Mars. They have places all over the solar system where you see collapsed lava tubes. Let's type collapse, 
collapsed lava tubes on the moon. Earth's moon shows them as well. Can you see that feature there? They think that that long cliff wall there was probably some kind of lava eruption that, that basically formed a long tube. So I think th the fact that we're seeing those collapsed lava tubes is indication that the eruption of the volcano itself is what built up the dome. And that's sort of like common sense. So let's, for why do you think so, let's go ahead, just collapse lava tubes, okay? That's the evidence that tells us that that channel is actually just a volcanic feature in nature. Okay, we'll cross out 17. We don't have to do that one because um, I think we've done enough today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed exploring the terrain of Mars with me. Take all of this, save it as a PDF or, you know, in Kim's case, take a photograph of your paper or Jenna, whatever you want to do, submit that to me somehow, okay? It'd be nice to have the questions with the answers. All right. Uh, well, thank you very much. On Wednesday, we'll start planetary atmospheres and we'll do a planetary atmosp atmospheres homework, okay? Okay, guys. Great hangs. I'll see you soon.